How do you define skating? Definition boxes of words, right? Germans have all these words for isness. Hebrew has different words for time, in terms of increment, that gives them greater perspective that we're not privy to because the nature of their vocabulary is more nuanced. So reeling back, how do we define skateboarding from the perspective of the average bear who flips it on and sees it in the Olympic as a sport? Skateboarding can never be compressed into something you measure in increments of time or distance, superlatives, right? He did the highest, furthest, longest, quickest, fastest. In terms of art and expression, skateboarding and art, you can take the silhouette of any particular skateboarder, just a silhouette of a still frame. Not only know who it is, whether it's switch or regular, just by the body language, I think that constitutes art, much less skate park. When you see not only what people do, but how they go about it through their landings, body language, by what tricks they do, how they take them. You know this person through what they do. In this sense, it is an art way past ballet, from my perspective. You name it, painting. Who am I to say? But as a skater, Van Gogh, sure. I recognize, I don't have the acumen, expertise to tell you everything about a Van Gogh. But the constraints, though it may last for hundreds of years on a wall and people can, I get it. But what does skateboarding represent in terms of the art and understanding not only who this person is, what they do, how they go about it. It shapes a whole culture through a language that those others don't even begin to have. So it is a union of sport, of art, community, connection, vocabulary that unites us in ways God knows. Tell me there's not a lot of at-risk people. When is something so valuable that it's keeping them, that they're haunted through child abuse or whatever it is they're going through, drug addiction, of should they end it now? Skateboarding has a cohesion to say, at least I belong, to attract those outcasts. Surely it belongs other places. But I have never experienced or seen any community that has such cohesion and meaning and connection, particularly in terms of integrating outsiders, whether you are blue-blooded and come from the highest families, or from the streets, or from abuse, or from royalty in the gang system, it unites people who don't otherwise fit together. So it is not just something a kid takes up because he doesn't know anything better, but it is something that can shape your perspective and how you see the world. What is the essence of neuroscience? A guy at the Media Lab told me this. Uh, it boils down to seeing the world differently. You tell me, do skateboarders see the world differently? every street, right? That is what skateboarding is to me, beyond boxes and words and definitions. It's state of being, it's connection, connectedness with what it is to be alive. Skateboarding can never be trunketed, fit, compressed into the notion, flat notion, of a sport where it's measured in yards or milliseconds, right? We're so much more dimensional. The fact that it can be projected flatly into something measurable, judged on ESPN, is helpful. But it, I've always looked at it as an artificial construct, a way to get money, a way to get TV coverage, which is fine. We need that. We need that. Everyone needs to survive. Dudes in football get destroyed, right? their brains, everything. So respect for that. They're going after it. But what skaters are doing, to me, is still different. Because it's not just on the field, it's practice, it's everywhere else where you're risking so much, especially doing something like that. And so the dudes that are doing that level of potential violence to their body, 
that already separates, like, look at what you're dealing with. Caution to the wind, doing something that's never been done. How often do you see that in sports? Like, really, the essence of our community is that we share something so much deeper that shapes us lifelong. And we share not only something physical, but an actual language that unites us, right? Two kids can, can text tricks back and forth, regardless of the language you understand. And you can strive and go after it. You get every nuance. I don't think any sport has that sport. Tony and I were called upon to do a talk in Vegas for IBM. And I related, because I come from chemical engineering four years, anyone who studied chemistry, particularly organic chemistry, you recognize the power in the distinction between a vernacular. All kinds of things have a vernacular. Boating has all these crazy words. Military has all these crazy words. Knitting has all these crazy words, right? Vernacular. But when is it in a nomenclature where it has almost scientific rigor? And so organic chemistry has a nomenclature. It is scientifically rigorous to the point that anybody reading these books or the back of, say, a drug, right? Whatever drug you bought, it has some fancy. All of its constituents, that language, it has meaning. You can draw the molecules and you understand how they work. I had a slide in that IBM talk with a bunch of names of organic molecules. That makes sense. Molecules named for organic, in the nomenclature of organic chemistry. So big molecular diagrams, and then their written names. And then scattershot, meaning intermixed, I had a bunch of skate tricks. Half cab, crooked guy, nollie, inward heel flip. And I made the point that by just looking at the name, we have a language of skaters that's so rigorous that the name themselves yields the movements of the trick, even if it's never been done before. And it's an international language. We have something, and we created as a community something that has more, dare I say, scientific rigor than even the most blue-blooded of sports. And I say that with pride. When I got off the stage, a CTO of VMware, wild-eyed, gave me a hug. He goes, you strike me as a wild duck. I'm a wild duck. And around here, it's always duck hunting season. Let's do something together. And so we leveraged their artificial intelligence at the time to, just for fun, as a little project, and it worked. It's actual paper. I was one of the only, certainly at the time, non-IBMers or civilians to ever write a genuine research paper with them, with their Watson team. And it was about the nomenclature of skateboard tricks and how AI could leverage it to be a creative tool. My point is, is I got a letter of recommendation for the Media Lab based on that paper of, you have no idea the significance of not only what I could do, but the nature of the community that I come from. And that's the kind of respect that our language has and its importance. Do you have a favorite trick? I think such a cool statement. The fact that it cannot be answered because of the dimensions that are woven into each trick, because of its innovation, the person who did it, the circumstances, where, how, how it integrated with terrain, the fact that I cannot answer it speaks to the beauty of skateboarding itself and why it is so truly you know, community-driven in its artistic nature. So no, I say pridefully, I don't have a favorite trick that I've ever seen because how could I possibly pick them? What is your relationship with Tony Hawk? My relationship with Tony is, man, just a good friend. We skated together for the Bones Brigade. Stacy picked us when we were kids. And we have been friends ever since. Yeah. Only closer with time. 
when we were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, it was pretty important years. At that time, skating was so shaped by contest results. Video was coming into being, but it had not yet hit. So the measure was, hey, what place? So for as much as I backhand contests, please know that I paid a price for that. Ten years of my life was devoted to contests. So I think I have the right to dismiss them and to say how little they mean. Best in show. I struggled with having to do two-minute runs skating for consistency rather than what drew me to it in the first place, which is the freedom of creating something and doing something that had never been done before. That is what drove me as a skateboarder. That's what drew me to it in the first place. You turn pro during those years for my personality. You are bent toward, oh, contests are very important, so devote more attention to them. And they can expropriate, usurp the meaning of what you do and you feel a slave to it. So I struggled with it, especially at the time because I won a lot in a row, as did Tony. And we were kind of put on like, oh yeah, of course Tony and Rob are going to win. He was invert, I was over in the corner of the flat. And I was over the pressure, I was over the feeling of this robbed me of what I want to do. There is only winning and losing. So second place, third place, they're all losing. I hated contests. And I hated the pressure. And I didn't want to enter in anymore. And so I would talk to Tony about it. I would often go stay at his place, Del Mar contests, week before, whatever. And that was the funnest of times being all there together. Not the contest themselves, just being there. And his family was beautiful and going like, just being together. Man, those were pretty special times. And Tony is part of that in a way that can't quite put to words. And then when I couldn't really take entering contests, he was the only dude I could talk to that understood. Because for as much as we're all pro skaters, or just skaters to begin with, we share something. That's true. It's true. But the experience of being put so much in a public eye or even on the same team in this, you know, Bones Brigade was certainly known. For being one of those two dudes, like that's, it's hard to find people to relate to necessarily. And that forged a bond that to me meant the world. Then there was a period, I was, I think, the first to leave Pau, Peralta, Bones Brigade. And I felt that I had betrayed the other dudes, that they'd be pissed, that they wouldn't want to talk to me. And so when I left, and then the way things went down with world, I thought, man, of all the people whose respect it mattered most, now I can barely, like, I feel like I can barely meet their eyes. And there was a little period where I didn't see him for whatever reasons. I'm just trying to learn how to street skate all the above. And I remember Tony was getting more and more projected in the public eye, and so while he was getting bigger, I felt getting smaller. I remember the first time I saw him, it had been a while thinking that it would be weird, or thinking... And I remember immediately, Rod! He's the same old Tony. He never changes. So do I share a special bond? Sometimes you don't recognize how special the bond is until you think it's gone. And then you realize, up close and personal, that not only is it the same, but you're older and wiser for it and it fuses you even closer. And time only makes that big a distinction. And for all the success that Tony has, it only makes him more humble, if that's possible. What does Tony Hawk mean to skateboarding? So the essence of the question is one of perspective. So from this outside perspective, what does Tony Hawk mean? Oh yeah, he's that guy. He's the skateboarder. He's the dude that did the 900. Man, that guy's amazing. Do you know him? Right? And if you nod and say, yeah, we're friends, respect goes up for you instantly. 
That's a perspective. Do you know why we see in three dimensions? Because our eyes take a little bit different perspectives and your brain figures out the differences and thus sees the depths. Parallax yields depths and greater perception. In this way, as someone who's walked in a similar steps, right, similar path, then Tony, what does he mean to skateboarding? Is like, oh wow, someone who just started, drawn to it because maybe he could do other sports, okay, but somehow never quite fit in. So we're the rejects in the back that fell in love with the rawness of the culture and the absolute freedom that we can create our own paths. He took that to another level, already not fitting in within a community of people that were already outsiders. Right, we know the stories, and Dwayne is so awesome. But didn't he actually say that, better said this way, that there were rumors of Dwayne spitting on Tony, right? So even amongst rejects, he was rejected. And as someone who, went through that, who took it for what it was, it's like, ah, I get it, and let it fuel him. He was someone who was always ahead of me, that I looked up to and inspired me, and that his tricks have not only changed skateboarding for what you do in terms of vert, but that inspiration gave me something to focus upon. Again, parallax and dimension. I didn't look up to other freestylers. Respect, of course. But I didn't look up to them. I needed someone who walked a similar path, but in a different way, so I could refocus. And it was Tony. So that ripples into everything that I did, which starts to change the perspective of what did Tony do for skateboarding. It influenced freestyle. It influenced street skating. It influenced the public face of it, <laughs> all of us as skaters, like how many trespassing tickets have you gotten, right? I've gotten so many I had to get therapy. When you get that many trespassing tickets, you have to go to counseling. I go in to some general term, one of dismissed, if not disgust, bureaucrats. The dude looks at me as, what are you doing here? He looks at my file. His measure of my stature was one of somewhere between contempt, disgust, to just another wasted hour, to, oh my God, yeah, I heard of this Tony Hawk guy, too. And now that I've met you, I had no idea. I walked out of his office into the waiting room where, guess what, as coincidence would have, truly, truly, there was another skater. And when he saw me, his eyes lifted up, and then we saw the bureaucrat, the counselor, looked at him looking at me, then back at me, put his arm around me. You play your cards right, one day you'll be just like Rodney or Tony. What is the point of the story? Right? Even from the people who think the least of us, in the worst of circumstances, they have a new respect for us. That goes a long way. Another time, I'm skating in another schoolyard, so you know the rules when you hop the fence, big fences. Um, it's trespassing. Trespassing sucks because they can make that what they want. Remember Colors, that movie, Robert Duvall looking cop? Been on doing it forever. I was skating the schoolyard. He comes in. They have keys to them all, right? They open it up. It's a long walk. I've got tables out there and there's a half dozen kids. One particular, I remember, is rough neighborhood, like gang neighborhood. One eye was already poked out and shaved head and there were scars visible on his head. Tough little kid. So I see him and I'm like, man, I don't want him to chain the tables, put him back. So I immediately, like we all, right, you put it on like a wheelbarrow, you put your board under the table, you, you start running it, you put him in place. By the time he gets there, because it's the way, it's huge. Cops looking at me. And his first questions were like, how'd you get in? I'm like, sir, I hopped the fence. Hmm. Where? I parked over there. Okay, let's go. We all know the drill, right? They can search your car, they look for burglary tools, which can be a pocket knife, right? I'm walking. 
No one's saying anything. Kids are intimidated. Gradually, the kids, being kids, they forget, and they start asking questions. Do you know Tony? Do you know all these people, right? What about this? What about that trick? After a while, you're just engaging with kids, because it's a little bit, and then he unlocks. We get through. And the kids at that time, you see how lit up they were, even the, like that, that little dude with the eye. And the cop was like, all right. He dismissed them. It's me and him, and he just looks at me with this crazy knowing stare. And he goes, you're free to go. I don't think that people realize the span of respect, of the cohesion of the skateboarding community that can make society better by having people, not necessarily me, but like Tony, to look up to. What that means to someone like a cop who sees the worst of it. So what has Tony done for skateboarding? He contributed to that. It's hard to sum. There's a Calc 2 trick in particle physics that, um, how do you sum infinite possibilities, infinite series? And it's not a big deal. Anyone in Calc 2 does this. It will converge to a finite number. There are tricks to this. So what you're saying is, how do I measure Tony's effect? There are so many ripple effects that do converge to finite ways that we experience if you live this life that are hard to put to words because there's so many in terms of their dimension. I busted my ankle out of nowhere. Like suddenly I didn't know who to call. So I called him up. And he was already a star. Like he was already like, it's weird. You ever had that experience where like you're friends and then somebody like suddenly you see him in a whole different way. And you think, oh man, like maybe you get kind of weird around him or kind of shy. And so here I am on crutches, met him up the street, California Pizza Kitchen. And he's like, hey, Rodney, same, same old Tony. We sit down. He's like, right, oh, you broke your ankle for it. Yeah, it happens. Who cares? It'll heal up. You'll get back to it. Stop making it weird. And by the way, would you be in my game? You know, simple as that. I had no idea. I was so honored. I was like, you really mean that? Yeah. How has Tony Hawk Pro Skater affected your life? I was trying to learn how to street skate. Stuck with that freestyle-y, rickety movement. Showing up at demos was embarrassing. That's true. And I was in the Northeast. It seems like it was Jersey. Maybe New York. Point being, I was in a place where people aren't shy to tell you you suck. I don't know. I forgot what m month the video game was released. Don't suppose it matters. But I had not been on the road. I hadn't done my first demo since the advent of the game. It felt like being dropped into an alternate universe. Because I was with all these dudes that skated a zillion times better than I. Freestyle was all but forgotten. And suddenly, the crowds around me, they put me on top of a van, the van started rocking, and I'm looking down at the dudes that are all better than I was, going, this is so unfair. That was the impact first. That was in the skate community. Wow, that's crazy. I've had all kinds of video parts come out. Nothing made that big a difference. And that's the core scene? Then going to airports and coffee shops and grocery store and wherever, people are like, oh, I played you in that video game. Respect from the general public had never been like that. People talking like our language for the first time again, that tripped me out. Random people come up and they know what, or at least they could figure out what a kickflip nose wheelie would be, right? That's rooted in the 900, in the video game. And then the influx of talent. The videos, the sponsor videos that were coming in. Like, they're skating like people do in the games. 
Whereas all of our videos, man, it takes, particularly me, it could take a hundred tries. It could take hundreds of tries to do that trick. Some of those tricks, I didn't even know I was rolling until a couple of seconds later, you know? Your head is so deep into it. But for whatever reason, the video games, they normalized it. And it did something to the consciousness of, again, normalization, how powerful is that in terms of belief? People started skating more like the video games. There was a punctuated progression in skateboarding that followed the video games that is hard to really put your finger on as to what was it that made skateboarding advance so quickly in those years. Could have been a lot of things. But there is no way that you can say the video games did not say or take a pronounced, it changed skateboarding at every level. Was the 900 something that you were hearing about? At that time, when everyone was going after the 900, I'm learning to street skate, worried about crooked grinds, right? Nollie flips out, that's where my head's at. But everyone, the entire community, knew what was going on when everyone was after the 900 or all the vert dudes. I remember thinking, man, everyone is so talented, they all have their superpowers. But I'm thinking, you know what, Sluggo, Junior Olympics, whatever he was on, that build of his, Viking, like, it's probably the landing, like lower, maybe that's what it's gonna take. Couldn't really figure it out, who's gonna land it? Cool thing about Vert, and again, coming from freestyle, which is way in its corner. Vert, definitely not as much in its corner, but not as much of a daily topic type of thing. Which in a sense made it cooler because all of those guys, like Danny, Tony, Bob, they were like so established and beyond. You looked at it as something higher going after something more. Tony is obviously so special, but then again, what it takes to land that thing, it might be a different, might be a function of structure, might be, who knows, right? Just simple disorientation, which brings you back to Sluggo. Who's gonna, or Danny, just that fire in Danny, right? Willing to just go down. And um, partly I, I thought it could be Bob because his orientation, the way he is with Switch, it just seemed that he might have a, better clarity in the air and figuring out how, so there's so many ways to look at it. My thoughts when Tony landed it were, yup, that makes sense. Partly, I didn't expect it because it seemed to be such an explosive thing to get that kind of spin. And then the landing, I pictured Danny, someone like that who's willing to <laughs> jump out of a helicopter, right? Like just, I'll, t I'll take it, whatever the hit is. But then watching Tony do it and seeing how he handled it, it made all the sense right away. What if the 900 didn't happen? If the 900 didn't happen at all, there's all kinds of ramifications. From the pers perspective of a vert skater, when there's a goal and that was such a clear goal that had everyone focused, everyone, meaning top dudes were trying that pretty consistently, that's the point. That energy and focus could have been funneled into other directions. It could have pushed out into other categories where there might have been quicker advancement. But then over time, you don't know how those things will evolve. Maybe it could have led to a branch that we don't even have today. I think on a much broader sense for all of us as skaters, if the 900 were never to have happened, that's subdivided into right now. I mean, people have gone beyond the 900. How does that rippled into the community? society's relationship with skateboarding, its acceptance, its cognizance. So I can go on and on, but the point is, it is hard to unpack the ramifications, not only for skateboarding itself, if it had not been done, what would our world look like? What would the opportunities look like? What about the talent that it brought in from people who had never even heard about skateboarding until that? It has changed skateboarding and progressed it in ways that are hard to account for. What if Tony didn't do the 900 at X Games? If Tony hadn't have done it at the X Games that night, especially in that environment, especially in that moment of that environment, it would be hard to match a better one. Flash to something more contemporary after the Olympics last summer, summer before last, whatever. I had so many random people, like, hey, 
thought of you, saw skateboarding in the Olympics. Man, you guys are different. You all root for each other. It's weird. It's kind of cool. What it showed, and now I'm jumping from the Olympics, which was so obvious and contemporary and recent, to what was happening in that moment where he landed that. They got to witness that, but then they got to see what all of those dudes were lifting and encouraging and saying, go after it, go again, go again, go again, until he landed it in the unfeignable, resolute joy that they all lifted Tony with. That moment, it was something so beyond just, oh, a feat. This was the crisp resolution of what we have as a community that is unobtainable for any other sport. It showed that we are dimensions above that. And so no wonder it shines as something so great in sports history because guess what? We stand as something so much more that they can't have. There are no cheerleaders. It's just the guys that are changing what is possible. That's what we have, and that's what Tony did. In a forum like that, broadcast to the world, that is what made it so special to me. Again, these ripple effects, you watch these corny movies where people go back in time and change one thing, and then you realize the entire world can be changed just by, right? Butterfly flapping its wings, one side of the world eventuates in tornadoes in the other. Tony's 900 changed skateboarding, and that it gave the world a glimpse, a look into the nature of our community and our strivings that appealed to all kinds of kids who'd never even thought of picking up a skateboard. This is just one facet, one thread, one flap of the wings. The fact that Tony's game came out as the 900, just put it out on a rocket for the world to see and took it to levels that no one would have ever thought. It made Tony a superstar. It hurled Tony in front of cameras, in front of celebrities of the world, <laughs> presidents who brought him to the White House, right? It put him in places that no other skater would be allowed to. And because of who Tony is as an individual, that burst just kept projecting forward. Because Tony is cool and he's smart and he's crystal, and he never got weak from success, right? Those old movies, right? Conan or whatever. As corny as the movies are, as the writer himself is profound. It's never the challenges, right, that can bring down the individual so much, but success. It has a way of suffocating a drive and smothering character. If anything, all that success it fed into who Tony is and made him stronger and shined that much more brighter, like oxygen to a flame. And so he took that and projected this even further. Thank goodness for all the talent that could have changed the lives. We would want that for all of us. But I would say as someone who knows Tony the way I do, <laughs> couldn't have happened to a better person, not just for him, Happy for a friend to see good times, but selfishly for all of us. Thank goodness it was Tony. Has there ever been a more important moment to a sport? I am a little bit careful to speak in superlatives about the achievements of every other sport. And again, how do we unpeel these things in time? I think football, soccer, soccer. I think there's stories like, hasn't it helped end wars, right? Championships. But it is to say, knowing what I know, um, nothing has changed my life or shaped contemporary culture more than I would think skateboarding's emergence into the public consciousness. Because it's always been, look at Friedman's book, Glenn Friedman, He's awesome, he's talented, and he had the insight of, oh, what do punk rock and hip-hop and skateboarding have in common? There's a certain fabric of character. 
It's not the perfection of something, it's the rawness in the authenticity of its projection, in the newness of it, in terms of, but is it real? It connects all together, which ripples into fashion and everything else, and is a good for society, because God knows it needs more real. Did the 900 change Tony? Did the 900 change Tony? It's always difficult, again, to unpeel these things, right? Particle physics is riddled with this stuff. Do things go backwards in time and what is our consciousness of it? This idea of unpeeling, going backwards and forwards in time, that's a heavy thing that people wrestle with. I don't think the human mind is really built for that. Does time exist? Heavy physicists struggle with this, right? It is easy to say. There's nothing theoretical about it. Yeah, man, I watched you like in a period of almost no time, right? From getting seen doing the 900 on TV. And then watching, I remember the Academy Awards, and then Tony popped up right afterwards at one of those crazy parties. And it just made me smile, like, oh my gosh, the life that he lives. And then you see him not long afterwards, and you realize, oh no, he's exactly the same. Only, and here's the thing where I would like to qualify and say, I would like to think I've had enough of experience of being in front of the public I, people, random people coming up to you go, oh, you're that guy. I've had this little bit of the coolest type of Fight Club fame, right? Where some dude with skin up elbows gives you a nod at Starbucks and waves you through. We've got the best type of it. Tony has experienced that same phenomenon on a level that none of us can really feel or experience or have experienced. But we have just a taste of it to know what the flavor is like. What's the weirdness of it? Which to me gives you the perspective of, yeah man, I know that there's this weird illusion that the greater your popularity, the more people you think that recognize you, the better you think life is. Everyone is susceptible to pride. God knows I am. None of us get through unscathed. So having had a little bit of that apple, that fruit, to know like, wow, that's weird. How do you make the most of being recognized? How do you turn that around and recognize it for what it is, that it's in their minds so that you can use it to lift other people? Because it's not about you, that it's a weird gift that doesn't mean it dissolves without other people, right? Tree in the forest. Tony has experienced levels of that beyond. And knowing what I know, to see how he engages with people, to see how conscious he is of the little ripples that other people generally aren't as sensitive to because they haven't walked that. They don't necessarily realize that, hey man, for as bad as this is, missed flights or people grumpy or whatever at airports, all the above, that some dude right is going to see you right in that moment go, oh my gosh, I've looked up to you my whole life and now I see you're a prick because you missed your flight, right? That gives you an awareness, a consciousness. Be more responsible with what we have. Be cool. There are other people in the room. Tony has seen that level and trust me, I know this. It only makes him better and more conscious. In this way, Tony, I look up to him even further. So yes, the fame has made him more humble and more conscious and made my respect for him only grow because I see how he wields it. You said that when the game came out, it had more of an impact than like video parts did. Hmm. And it kind of changed like industry more. Socrates, Leal, in the history of skate videos. Sock, humble, Sock, he has had such an impact on skateboarding in his videos. And me, personally, Mike Tanaski, Plan B, those videos introduced me to what modern videos are all about. The things I shot with Stacy, better said, the videos that I was so grateful that Stacy shot of me to include me in the Bones Brigade videos. 
that set a new paradigm. They were done in a weekend. I shot one on the way to the airport on my way out, something like that. When it came to Plan B videos, Mike T introduced me to, we are going to capture your soul in the sense of all your aspirations, ideas, whatever you can come up with. I don't care how long it takes. It was corny. Like he gave us protein drinks, go get in the jacuzzi, you got to be ready for tomorrow. Like that was ridiculous to me. <laughs> and then after a while, weirdly, I longed for it. What I'm doing is laying the foundation for videos meant everything to me as a skater and shaped the culture in ways. There's a lot of reasons for that. We could talk about it for hours. Now that I've stated that, I'm going to backhand it. Yeah. But first, please understand the significance. With Socrates, I used to go out with Sock. I'd get a trick, it'd be Sunday. I'm shivering, right, because you're starving. Your sweat has dried, your clothes are wet, you made it from wherever, downtown to home. And he would have that little <laughs> cassette, right, that Hi8 or whatever it was, mini DV, of the trick that it took you forever. And I'd be, suck, can we go transfer it now? Can we get copies of it now? He's like, right, I'll do it tomorrow morning. A couple times I would have to leave on a Saturday. I would leave to Sunday or whatever. I'd fly a sock, man. If my plane goes down, this is the madness. If my plane goes down, make sure it goes in like this. With all my heart, hand on a stack of Bibles. I said that. And he looked at me with Socrates clarity. Like, Rod, you'll be dead. It won't matter. And I remember being checkmated. Just do it anyway. Promise me. And he'd laugh. And I'd laugh and drive away. Please understand this is the significance of video parts to me. Especially coming from freestyle. As someone who didn't fit in. And was trying to make my way. And understood how empty it was to be called champ measured by a contest record. Empty. When Tony's video game came out, I have been to, premieres are a big thing. Everyone's there, all the talk afterwards in that moment. I'll never forget virtual reality, like all those premieres, virtual especially. When Tony's game came out, again, this is a spectrum of popularity or recognition versus respect. Because popularity is like eating styrofoam. There's nothing in it. But respect is when people understand what you do and they see what you do and can communicate it. I saw what you did. It connected with what I do. Oh, God knows you know how long I strive for that. Hopefully, I've made it clear how much videos have meant to any pro skater, especially during that era. Tony's video games, it's not the same experience. Nothing is that experience. And yet, as I say, popularity, you can have a stadium light up. And I've actually had something close to that. When you have a stadium, a stadium meaning, I don't know, 15,000 people or so, light up at once, it shocks you viscerally. It really does. It really, it's weird. When you've experienced that, it's a high as a generality. But in particular, when you start meeting those people after, you're like, cool, cool. There's nothing more to it. What Tony's videos did is it gave meaning to what we do, to a, a, a popular culture that wouldn't otherwise have connected. They don't know the videos. Something about the vocabulary, something about engaging the immersion of video games by their nature. When people are immersed, they feel in a way that's beyond words. And when they connect with you in a way that's beyond words, you feel it in your spirit and soul. Tony's video games, they contributed to that in a pronounced way that I had never felt before. 
and it never ended.